into Mind Shock. This is Bruce McGuire. We haven't delved too much into ancient mysteries, a lost world, alternate history timelines, and the like. But lost civilizations, lost kingdoms and empires are very fascinating, especially what remains of these accounts that point to the possibility, if not solid evidence, of proof of their existence. I recently discovered an account uh, of a story published in the Daily Alaskan, March 18th, 1920, about the lost tribe of the Arctic. Usually a lot of these stories of Atlantis or Lemuria or Mu are based all over the world, but few in the Arctic. So this is a very, very interesting account of an expedition in the 1920s. If you believe the Giza Plateau, the pyramids, and the Sphinx were once underwater 10,000, 20,000, or even longer years ago, and how climate has changed, affecting some of these claims or possibilities, theories, of ancient civilizations, where they lived, and how the world has changed since. The famous Piri Reis map shows Antarctica without ice, with greenery and animals, as well as other maps from ancient times, showing the landscapes not as they are now. Could the Arctic be such a possibility? And this also intersects some hollow earth theories that the North Pole, South Pole might be entrances, uh, Mount Shasta, some other majestical areas on earth that might be entrances to other worlds, tropical paradises in the middle of Arctic tundra or in the middle of nowhere. So this is uh, one of the least known accounts of the lost tribe of the Arctic. Hidden for centuries under the ice fields of Alaska, a scientific expedition discovered the remains of an unknown prehistoric Arctic race. This remarkable find of an unknown race includes the fully clothed remains of 100 individuals who apparently met sudden death in a village of six huts, afterward covered by ice and snow, where they remain sealed until the present time. The life habits and physical appearance of this tribe bore little resemblance to the Eskimos. The discovery was made near Point Barrow, the northernmost tip of Alaska. Dr. Van Valin, head of the expedition, was sent out two and a half years ago by the University of Pennsylvania to make an exhaustive study of the Eskimos. He was investigating a shallow swale in search of Eskimo relics when his attention was attracted by the peculiar character of some debris. This led to a still further examination. Buried beneath four feet of ice, snow, and tundra were uncovered what was recognized at once as the wreckage of a collection of ancient huts. They had been constructed of driftwoods of various kinds, covered by dome-shaped roofs cut from the tundra. The roofs had long since fallen in, while little remains even of the sides of the huts. The great discovery, however, was made when the explorers came upon the first of the frozen bodies. In many instances, the position of the bodies all in a perfect state of preservation, frozen in solid blocks of ice, suggested that death had overtaken them unexpectedly. Some had died in the act of drinking, at least that is the supposition from the presence in their hands of what appeared to be long tubes, one end of which was held between the lips. Of the hundred or more bodies, nearly all were fully attired. Many were lying on beds covered by polar bear skins. The apparel worn by some showed that the race had learned to fabricate clothing from the skins of birds, and that they also understood the art of tanning or curing skins of animals. One thing seems certain. The community was overtaken by some suddenly developing catastrophe. Included among the bodies found in a perfect state of preservation were men, women, and children of all ages. The clothing, furs, and skins were in perfect condition. Exposure to the air, however, quickly caused much of it to disintegrate. As a result, fuse... 
As a result, but few specimens of the clothing are included in the collection brought back by Mr. Van Volen. Unfortunately, the fate which befell the skins and furs and bird skin suits awaited the wearers as well. Although when discovered many of the bodies still retained their flesh, there was no means at the command of Dr. Van Valen for preserving them. But a few hours' exposure to warmer air was required to cause the fleshy portions to slough away. Fortunately, however, the skeletons remain intact, perfectly articulated, and within a very short time will be in the University Museum. Many interesting relics were discovered in the ruins, including pieces of pottery. Inquiries by Dr. Van Volen among the Eskimos proved that they had no traditions connected with the ancient inhabitants whose remains he had discovered. So, again, very mysterious account uh there's little information on it i was able to find corroboration of van volen and his expeditions in the arctic um in the museum journal volumes eight to nine uh excerpt mr van volen was sent in june into the arctic regions of northern alaska to make collections among the eskimo there he is spending the winter at or near point barrow these two alaskan expeditions have been provided for by the generosity of mr john wanamaker vice president of the board of managers and this was published in the museum journal Philadelphia, March 1917, University of Pennsylvania. Also in the Pennsylvania Gazette, Volume 18, Issue 4, October 21st, October 24th, 1919, there's a little excerpt on uh, Van Valen. Van Valen reaches Seattle. A telegram has just been received at the university from Mr. William B. Van Valen from Seattle saying that he had arrived safely with all his collection intact. As he had sailed from Cape Nome on October 1st, the museum authorities were becoming worried lest he might have met with disaster. Mr. Van Valen announces that he has shipped his collections, including remains of a number of prehistoric Eskimos, to the museum and would soon follow. He will deliver a lecture at the Muse University Museum in December concerning his three years' experience in the Arctic regions. He sends on a lot of motion picture films and photographs, as well as phonograph records, which will be of interest to the public and especially to scientists who believe that his achievements will do much to throw light on the origin of the Eskimo race. This is considered one of the most important expeditions ever undertaken by the University Museum, which has been financed by Mr. John Wanamaker. Also, there's mention of Van Valen's discovery in Discussion and Correspondence, Eskimo Archaeology and Somatology, published 1934, American Anthropologist. What were the physical characteristics of the bearers of this culture was not known until, unfortunately, in 1918, Van Valen discovered a group of mounds near Point Barrow, Alaska, which contained a series of skeletal remains associated with artifacts of Thule type. That this culture belonged to the Thule people is a fact that has been adequately and conclusively demonstrated by Mason. And further, that this was a historically ancient site is attested to by Van Valen, who on questioning the present inhabitants of Point Barrow found that they had no historical recollection of the existence of any previous group in this region or that these mounds were actually igloos so this article is stating that they were demonstrated to be fuel culture whereas so fuels are defined as proto inuits the ancestors of all modern inuits very interesting stuff. Um, another article from the Santa Cruz Sentinel, January 29th, 1933, reads, Professor Van Valen was leader of the John Wanamaker expedition to Point Barrow, Alaska, in research work for the University of Pennsylvania Museum in Philadelphia. He is said to have discovered, excavated, and brought back specimens of a lost prehistoric tribe, progenitors of the North American Eskimo, together with their strange hand which was buried in five and one-half feet of ice for ages. 
And another interesting article, the origin of the question of the origin of Eskimo culture, featured in American Anthropologist, Volume 32, October, December 1930, number four. The question of the origin of Eskimo culture by Thurkel Mathiasen. The question of the origin of Eskimo culture has in the course of time occupied many scientists. Where did they come from, these curious people, differing in body, language, and culture from the other American natives? Are they Asiatics who in comparatively recent time intruded in American soil, or are they a branch of the American race which has undergone a special development in the Arctic? Or possibly the descendants of the Arctic people who in the distant past once inhabited Europe, the Paleolithic cave dwellers of the Ice Age? Or are there still other possibilities? The first to frame a theory about the origin of the Eskimo was the Moravian missionary Kranz, who lived in Greenland in the middle of the 18th century. Kranz thought that they were physically and linguistically related to the Mongolians of Central Asia, especially the Kalmucks. On account of political disturbances in their home country, they were driven away to the northeast and crossed the Bering Strait to the Arctic coasts of North America. They reached Greenland in the 14th century, where their arrival caused the destruction of the Old Norse settlements. In 1865, C.R. Markham propounded the theory that the Eskimo originally lived in the north coast of Siberia, east of Cape Shalagskoy. But owing to political disturbances in Central Asia, were driven northwards out over a number of partly hypothetical Arctic lands and then over the North American Arctic archipelago, where innumerable ruins marked their path, and so came to Greenland. In 1874, Boyd Dawkins set forth a new and surprising hypothesis that the Eskimo were the descendants of the Paleolithic cave dwellers of Europe, who followed the reindeer to the north when the ice disappeared. The evidence on which he based his theory was the similarity in the hunting implements and art of the two people. Quite a different theory was advanced by the Danish scientist H. Rink. He considered the Eskimo to be an originally inland race who descended the rivers to the coast. There, they adapted their culture to the new surroundings, and only after the new Eskimo culture was formed did they spread out over the huge areas which they now occupy. The subarctic form of Eskimo culture he took to be the most typical, and he considered the mouth of the Yukon in Alaska as the most favorable place for the development of this culture. After a study of the legends and traditions of the Eskimo, Boaz, in 1888, came to the conclusion that their home must be in the central regions since the legends point that locality as the place from which the migration started. In the same year, Murdoch arrived at a similar conclusion by adopting a more cultural point of view since he considered the culture in the central regions to be more primitive than that to the east and west. As the native place of the Eskimo, he fixed on the region south to the Hudson Bay. Thalbitzer considers Siberia to be the home of the Eskimo, and in this he is supported by Bogoras. Their reasons are, however, principally linguistic. In 1905, Steensby propounded a new theory which he further developed in his interesting book in 1916. According to him, the Eskimo culture first arose on the barren grounds, the woodless region between Hudson Bay and Coronation Gulf, through an adaptation to the Arctic conditions of the culture which we find among the forest Indians. It then gradually made its way to the coast, took on sea facet, and spread east and west to Greenland and Siberia. Steensby called this original Eskimo culture Palea Eskimo. Around Bering Strait, though, the influence of Palea Asiatics and Pacific races across the neo-Eskimo culture with woman's boat and kayak, a pronouncedly coast culture which now spread eastwards and deposited a new stratum over the whole Palea Eskimo culture. Hat would reverse Steensby's stratification, that which Steensby calls neo-Eskimo, the decided coast culture, is the older, whereas the markedly inland Palea Eskimo culture is later.
Hatt thinks that the northern coasts of America have first been taken into use by an old coast culture, which undoubtedly stood in connection with Paleoasiatic cultures in Northeast Asia, and which contained the elements which are now absent in a part of the central region, namely the umiak, the fishing net, the gut skin shirt, urine tanning, the square house, woman's boat, etc., and besides naturally a part of the elements which are now to be found among all Eskimos, such as the sea harpoon, fish spear, bird dart, etc. Into this old coast culture then came one, or more likely several culture and race streams from the lands between Hudson Bay and Mackenzie River, carrying with them, among other things, the kayak, and just in virtue of this valuable culture element, succeeded in spreading over the northern coast of America, absorbing and partly transforming the earlier culture and extending the Eskimo language as far as southern Alaska and eastern Greenland. To investigate these matters was one of the main problems of the fifth fuel expedition to be solved partly by archaeological investigations in the central regions and also by a study of the people of today, especially the Caribou Eskimo of the barren grounds west of Hudson Bay. This last was undertaken by Nud Rasmussen and Burkitt Smith, and on the basis of their work, they regard the Caribou Eskimo as the last survivors of the primordial Eskimo. The possessors of that primitive Eskimo culture, which was developed on the barren grounds even before it had gotten so far as to take on a sea facet. This, then, they thought was the solution of the question of the origin of Eskimo culture. In my work, Archaeology of the Central Eskimos, I did not enter into the discussion of the origin of Eskimo culture, but simply put the different theories up against each other. The reason was that in my central archaeological material, I did not find a basis for a satisfactory solution of this question, and besides, I knew that Burkitt Smith was working to give his theories their final form. Since the Burkitt Smith's large and important book, The Caribou Eskimos, has been issued, where he fully discusses the problem, and besides, some important material from the western regions has appeared, throwing light on the question. In a way, I think there is now a better basis for a real discussion of the subject, though it can hardly be solved definitely until more archaeological work has been done. Matthiasen goes on to make comparisons with the Thule culture and goes into great detail about all of the ac uh, all the artifacts, dog harnesses, swivels, how they cut the clothing, harpoon heads, and their architecture, as well as the snow knife of the Thule culture and how it compared to the Caribou Eskimo and other tribes. The other mention is soapstone cooking pots. Burkett Smith regards the soapstone cooking pots as older than the clay pots, contrary to my formerly expressed view. In the West, round cooking pots are the predominant form both in the present culture and in the old finds, referencing Van Volin and Bernick. We also find here imported soapstone pots from the East, but this importation is shown by the archaeological material to be rather new. Neither the Van Volin nor the Bernerk collections contain any soapstone. In the Thule culture, we have, besides the remains of clay vessels, rounded soapstone pots. These last predominate in Greenland. As the Thule culture is derived from the West, I must still maintain that the most natural explanation of these rounded soapstone pots is that they are derivations from the round clay vessels. He then compares other elements that were developed further by the caribou Eskimo than the Thule culture. He then references, how then are the caribou Eskimo to be regarded? Are they coast people who in former times went inland and there changed their culture? Or are they remnants of a formerly much more extensive inland Eskimo population? The question is still difficult to decide. In my archaeological work, I made a suggestion that a group of Eskimos, when from the west they got to the coast regions between Coronation Gulf and Boothia, were enticed into the country by the great herds of caribou, where on barren grounds they reformed their culture. In this case, the culture of the caribou Eskimo should rather be called residual than primitive. With the well-known love of the Eskimos for caribou in preference to all other meat, such a migration with the herds in the country does not at the outset seem incredible. 
If this explanation of the culture of the Caribou Eskimo is correct, the Thule culture is the oldest in the central regions. The first Eskimo to migrate over the Arctic coasts of Canada and Greenland were thus the carriers of the Thule culture, and as we have the home of that culture in the West, it is to the West that we must turn to find the original home of the Eskimo. Whether the Thule culture is also the oldest form of Eskimo culture in the Western regions is another question which is still awaiting a solution. We as yet know too little of the development of culture in, the, in this area. We have first to find out the elements which this Western Thule culture possessed, and here we are only at the beginning, even though the recent discoveries, especially the Van Volen collection, have brought much new information. Besides, we do not know much about the range and importance of Genesis Bering Sea culture. These, the conditions seem to be very complicated here, and we have yet to build upon the chronology of the Alaskan Eskimo. After the discovery of the elements of the oldest Eskimo culture in these regions comes the task of finding out from where these elements have come, how and when they were fused together to form that synthesis, which is the Eskimo culture. Many of the elements of the Eskimo culture, such as Burkett Smith's investigation has shown, are very old and widely distributed in time and space. Burkett Smith has made it probable that many of them have their roots in ancient, late or epipaleolithic circumpolar ice hunting culture. I think, however, that Burkett Smith has in some degree overestimated the age of Eskimo culture, or in any case of its distribution over the Arctic coast of North America. Both the cultural and linguistic conditions seem to indicate that the distribution is not so very old. I hardly think that many thousands of years have passed since the Eskimo first arrived on the shores of Canada and Greenland. They probably dwelt for a longer period around the Bering Strait, but this future archaeologists have to elucidate... An attempt to trace all the elements of the oldest Eskimo culture will not be made here. Burkett Smith has done an important work towards solving this question, but he has not included all the elements of the Eskimo culture in the discussion. And besides, he has usually taken only North America and Northern Asia into consideration. To get to the bottom of this problem will necessitate far-reaching studies. Here I shall only mention that a number of the elements of the Eskimo culture, and among these some of the most important, seem to have been derived from Asia. The bow with the sinew backing and the compound bow, the dog sledge, sail, bow drill, needle case, thimble, fire drill, lamp, pottery, snow beater, chain links, needle and thread tattooing, and probably harpoon heads of the fuel type with open sockets. The only finds outside of the Eskimo territory where the last are to be met are from an old Lapish camping site in northern Norway and from the Stone Age of Japan. I believe we must look to the Old World for the deepest roots of the Eskimo culture. One of the most detailed articles on Van Valen and this expedition is actually a Penn Museum article. In 1917, John Wanamaker, vice president of the museum's board of managers, sponsored William V. Van Valen to make ethnographic observations and collections in the area around Point Barrow, the northernmost point of land in Alaska. A former Alaskan school teacher, Van Valen had long years of experience in the wilderness and knew the territory and its inhabitants well. At first, he concentrated on recording all aspects of Bering Strait Eskimo life, particularly the famous whale hunt through film, photography, and phonographic records. In 1918, one of his informants, an Eskimo named Utoyok, reported finding human bones protruding from a mound of earth on the tundra about eight miles from the Barrow settlement. This mound and several others like it had previously been assumed to be weathered glacial deposits. What Van Villen found instead was that some at least contained the well-preserved skeletons of men, women, and children, many still wrapped in skins and furs and accompanied by an assortment of tools and utensils. From the wooden construction inside, Van Villen deduced that these mounds were ancient igloos whose inhabitants had been overcome by some natural disaster, such as starvation or disease. He seems to have held to this belief despite later investigations which showed that the igloos were in fact prehistoric burials. The news of Van Valen's archaeological discoveries caused quite a sensation upon his return to Nome in September 1919. Newspapers gleefully recounted his find of frozen people and speculated on the mystery of their death. In the open debate over sudden versus slow catastrophes, one of the most delicious lines came from November 
New York Herald story, Mr. Van Valen does not believe that the village was overwhelmed by a glacier. Enjoying almost equal prominence with the skeletons was Van Valen's youngest child, a boy born during the two-year expedition in Point Barrow. Wildly heralded as the snow baby, the child was touted as the second white baby ever born in the Arctic. Van Valen later referred to him in a 1945 letter to George Valiant, then director of the museum, as the most valuable byproduct of the late Honorable John Wanamaker expedition. By 1928, museum analysis of Van Valen's remarkable discoveries had further aroused scientific interest. J. Alden Mason studied the artifacts found in the association with the skeletons and determined that they belonged to the archaic Eskimo fuel culture. This conclusion Conclusion excited the interest of Arctic archaeologists for it meant that the Point Barrow sites were the first where excavated human remains had been found with fuel objects. Concurrently, the skeletal material had been turned over for analysis to the Y Star Institute and Dr. Elez Hrildica of the Smithsonian Institution. The result of the investigation was that the skeletons were of a radically different physical type from the modern Eskimo inhabiting the area. Furthermore, in Hrildilika's words, they resembled to the point of identity the physical type of the present Eskimo of Greenland. In a thoughtful review of the problem, Mason suggested that the Eskimos of the Thule culture were the pan-Arctic ancestors of the present Eskimo, whose culture and physical type had been modified differently in different areas by admixtures of other populations. He went on to propose that in Alaska, the modern Eskimo were the descendants of both the ancient Thule and local Indian populations, and therefore physically distinct from both. The announcement of Hrildika's and Mason's results attracted considerable interest at the 1928 meetings of the International Congress of Americanists in New York. Current interpretation differs from Mason's. The artifacts Van Volen excavated are now attributed to the Bernerk culture, AD 500 to 1000, which precedes the Thule culture, 1000 to 1850, in the Barrow area. Also, despite similarities in material culture, there is no basis for believing in a genetic intermixture of Eskimo and Indian populations. Shortly after these sessions, Hrildilika received word from Point Barrow that heavy looting was destroying the sites. Several mounds remained intact, however, and promised to yield as complete and well-preserved an archaeological example as those excavated by Van Valen. Hrildilika also learned that local opinion in Barrow concurred with Arctic scholars in doubting that the mounds were really igloos. He wrote to Mason, who in turn persuaded that the museum to finance further excavations at Point Barrow. Accordingly, in 1929, the museum contracted Arthur Hobson, a Point Barrow resident, to investigate more of the ancient structures and compare them to abandoned igloos in the same area. Hobson's work confirmed that the sites were the ruins of driftwood charnel houses representing a type of burial unknown before in the Arctic. His excavations also added substantially to the collections already made by Van Valen. So Van Valen is mentioned and his artifacts are pretty much verified by all these different papers and academic resources. So the question is, what exactly did he find? How similar was it to the other tribes? Was it isolated? This paper seems to suggest that a separate culture may have branched off from an existing culture and gotten pretty different. And then I guess this settlement that he found might have just been that. Or, as the more extreme, open-minded thinkers might suggest, was it some kind of a colony? Of a, of a completely lost civilization? Was it a global civilization? There's a lot of stories of these. So basically, this they're attributing his finds to ancestors of the fuel culture, although so much is unknown in that area. So depending on your beliefs and different theories, the Arctic might once have not been covered with ice, and civilizations there could have existed prior thousands of years earlier. So very, very interesting stuff.